Thanks, Ado. I think I'll sit strong. Oh, look at that. I could be on the worship team. Cool. Hey, guys, thanks, uh, everyone, for coming out. I know some days it's a bit harder than other days. Amen? And um, I just think God has a plan for our lives. God has a plan for our church. God has a plan for your life. Um, just while I was preparing in worship, uh, Greg, God told me the devil forgot who he's messing with. Um, he's forgotten who he's messing with. Um, and on that track, I just want to remind the devil who he's messing with. Um, yeah, I've had one of them weeks, one of them little bits actually, a bit longer than a week. Melissa sends her apologies and her love. She's at home. Tiffany has got pneumonia, so she's at home with pneumonia. She's in hospital yesterday and just praise God. And just sometimes the devil just gets you angry. And my plan is just to bust him up. So, well, the scripture actually says that we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. So I'm going to sort of take it from that angle. And uh, the series we're speaking about this week is called Empower. And our goal really with this series is to help you guys step into what God has for you. We believe that everybody has, a, that God has a plan and a purpose for every single life. Uh, and that uh, through your life, uh, you, God has a plan to impact your community and we also believe that every single person has been connected by God into the local church and that each person is a part of the body of Christ which is the church and that as much as we've have a, we all have a function in the church and we have a plan and a destiny for our lives uh, extending from that. So our goal with this series is to really help you guys discover and walk in what God has for you. And Pastor Adele spoke amazingly last week. And um, my, my real takeaway from her message, who knows what she actually spoke about. I, I, I'm the sort of person like you, well, you know, you walk away and you've got your own message. You're like, yeah, that was so good. And you tell people about this message you heard. And other people are like, I didn't get that at all. I got this. My takeaway from Adele's message last week was a transfer. It was a swapping. And um, it, it, was, it was giving everything for God's cause and, and him giving everything in return, so much more in return. And that was my takeaway from, from Pastor Adele's message. And, and I want to follow down that track this morning. But um, I remember when I was a quite a new Christian, I remember, well, I remember just promising God. I, just, just, I said, I'll swap this life for the next one. And um, I'm, I'll, I'll take it back a little bit further because I, I just, actually, before we start, I'm going to pray just because why not? Lord, <laughs> you're good. Amen. Amen. God's good. Now, there's this passage in Ephesians, and this is, I mean, I say this all the time, it's my favorite passage, who actually knows? Though I think this is my genuine favorite. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20. I know, every, it's all good. It's all good. It, this whole book, it's all good. You should read it. It's good. It's a, but Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20, I've got from the Passion Translation, it says, Never doubt God's mighty power to work in you and accomplish all this. He will achieve infinitely more than your greatest request, your most unbelievable dream, and exceed your wildest imagination. He will outdo them all, for his miraculous power constantly energizes you. Never doubt God's mighty power to work in you. Man, you see why it's my favorite? says he will achieve more than your greatest request, more than your most unbelievable dream and exceed your wildest imagination. What that means is he will do more. What's a request? It's an ask. What's an ask? It's a prayer. You ask God for something, you're praying more than your wildest prayer, more than your most unbelievable dream. What's that? A dream is something that you like it, it, it's something that's amazing but not possible something that's amazing but out of reach he says he can do that plus and then more than your wildest imagination so you've got a dream and sometimes a dream has got a tiny bit of tangibility to it sometimes it's like right well if i do this and this and work really hard and all of this we can just make it happen a wild ima an imagination goes like let's just set the limits off and and just and just and just dream just a let's just just take all limits off if there, if I could not fail if I had no limitations what would I do that that 
is what this is talking about. Your wildest imagination. God's, this scripture is saying God can do it. He can do it. And so for me, I remember the thing is, is, is God's put that in every person. We've all got this innate awareness that there is invincibility, that there is infinity inside of us. The scripture says that God has placed eternity in the hearts of all men. That there's this sense of forever in you. There's God, you were created in the image of the invincible, immeasurable, infinite God. You're created in his image. That means that you have that nature. And by that nature, that doesn't mean you have that same feeling. No, that means you've actually got the same properties. So we're in this position where we're all made like this and very few of us are aware of it and even fewer of us are stepping into it. And what I'd really love to do this morning is, is maybe just give you a tiny taste of how we can step into that. Amen? So I remember like, uh, so for, for those people who, who know me, or don't even know me, maybe have heard of me a little bit. Sorry, I'm not centered. It's not OCD. <laughs> it's attention to detail. <laughs> maybe a little bit. Maybe a little bit. Thank you, Lord. Uh, like, so, so this place where it's like, uh, there's, there's this photo of me, and it's like I'm, I'm in a coma, and I'm, and I'm basically I'm dead. I'm being like, kept alive on life support. And I remember my, I remember waking up from that coma, and my dad. Um, like my dad was in the room and that was weird because he lived in over east and I'm like, okay, this is weird. Something's going on here. And, and that was really my only thought. I thought nothing about waking up in hospital. At that time I was a drug addict. I had no purpose for life. I hated living. Um, I had, I, I didn't want to be alive. Um, it was regular. Overdoses were a normal thing. Hospital was a normal thing. The only thing weird was that my dad was there. And what I found out later, I'd been in a coma for a week. And, 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 that, and my dad took a photo. My dad, he was, um, he, he was a nurse. He's, he ended up finishing working in mental health. But he uh, did a lot of his time as a, an ED nurse, which those people are loose, man. Rob up the backs an ED nurse. No, these people, they're different. No, no, because they have to see stuff every day. Stuff that would wreck your life. That's called Tuesday for these people. Like, I'm serious, dead serious. They're like, they're, they're like, they operate different to us. And they need to, and we're glad they do. But, so my dad took a photo of me in this position. And I remember just thinking, you're an odd dude, man. Like, that is so weird. Anyway, that photo has gone all over the world, and, and, and it's been used by God to do a lot of things. But um, a lot of people see that photo, and they'll say, you know, that, you know, was that your rock bottom moment? Was that when you realized, was that the lowest point in your life? And the truth of it was, is I just did not care. I, I seriously didn't care. Um, it was actually my friend Greg up the back who rang the ambulance for that. And, um, that, that, and he actually apologized for ringing the ambulance, just so you know. He was like, hey, I, I know, because he knew I didn't want to live. He knew I didn't want to live. He, and, and he said, hey, I'm sorry for that. And I was like, well, I know having someone die in your lounge room is not good. I, I get it. That's cool. But, I, but I, I was like, but just understand, that's where I was at. And, and people say, was that your lowest moment? And I, it wasn't. Like, it wasn't. My lowest moment was driving along the Mitchell, where the Mitchell Freeway changes into the Quinana Freeway, just crossing the river below Parliament House. And I remember it so well. I was in the car with one of my mates. Now, this guy, I've known him since I was 12. This car was a bit banged up because this guy was crazy. And I mean, like, crazy. Not like take photos of people in hospital beds crazy. This guy was like, he would drive his car like a video game crazy. Like, I'm not even kidding. Like, you know, in the video games, those who, uh, you know, you, where you crash into the cars and you, you go through. Yeah, this was that guy. Not, no exaggeration. This was him. And that wasn't even to get away from the police. That was just to score drugs because we're hanging out. To get away from the police, this guy would punch right through police cars. The dead set. This is, you know, I'm in the car with this guy, you know, very good friend of ours. Known him since I was 12. And, you know, I'm driving along, and I remember, I was just so clear, like, it was warm summer's day, window down, arm on this thing, because, you know, that's what cool people do. That was cool. I used to be, I'm not anymore, I, like, I just bought a helmet for my skateboard. <laughs> well, at least I skateboard, that's, like, cool. And, and so I'm like... And a song come on, and I know I've shared this story before, but 
uh, the song came on the radio and it was a, a song by this amazing band called Grinspoon. Some of you will know it. <laughs> anyway, this, the, the, the lyrics, the particular lyrics that stuck out to me says, were you born to be a star? Were you born to be more than you are? And that second man, I knew, I knew that I knew that I knew that God had put in me, he, he had put infinity in me. I knew that I'd been called to do something amazing. I knew that, he, that there was an in, that, that innate greatness that God has put in every single person was in me. And at that point, I thought I'd missed my opportunity to express it. I thought there was no moving forwards for me at this point. I thought I was stuck. I thought I couldn't go. I, I thought that, I thought the, the, that is when hopelessness hit me. That is when I just, I had no, there was no recourse. I was, I was, I think I was 19 years old. I was a heroin addict. I had never heard of one person getting off drugs. Um, and I, I just figured this was my life. I, I figured this was my life. And I remember those words, it was, are you born to be a star? Are you born to be more than you are? Are you born to be more than you are? And I just remember, I was sitting and, and I knew I was, I knew I was. And I was stuck in this seat, going to score heroin from the other side of the river. So I could feel good for a few hours. And who knows what I did to get the money? Who knows what we're doing to get there? All of these things, just to feel good. And I just was, that was my lowest point. That was my rock bottom moment. You know, praise God, that guy, he, um, through my life and my testimony, my witness, he was able to actually come to Christ and he's turned his life around. And um, it's unrecognizable now. The guy who brought me into that scene, he um, was best friends with that guy. He uh, was the sort that used to carry a gun around. That was him. He did a fair bit of jail. Um, he got saved in jail, radically encountered Jesus in prison. He, he started to be like a full on, like he, he, you know, the run the prison Joseph story. This was like this. He would just get amazing opportunity instead of taking the highest position though in the prison he took the position where he would deal with the newcomers and him and another friend of mine who was in a guy and another guy I grew up with who was in prison for trafficking um they would put together new people packs you know we have new they would put together new people packs for jail and help people come <laughs> and they turned their prison into a ministry and these anyway this guy he did his time, uh, came out, and then uh, started started just serving at his local church. And I remember one time he rang up, um, and I had him on speaker, and um, I was he, he rang up, and um, he's just saying, "Hey man, I, I'm I'm pretty I'm, I'm in a jam here." I, and it wasn't like bad things were happening. A lot of things, good things were happening. A lot of good things were happening. His business was flourishing. Um, he had really felt the call to serve God and, he, and he's in church. He was just, he felt like he was not committed beyond what God was saying, but he felt he was committed beyond his physical capability. And, and, and he was telling us this and he's like, I, I just, I don't know what to do, man. And, and Melissa was in the car cause I had him on speaker and she said like, you know what? I just think God wants you to push through. I, I just think you just don't know what's on the other side of this. Today, that guy's a pastor of an amazing church in Armidale. Um, th this is... Uh, so through my witness and his witness, this guy, this lunatic car driver, um, you know, he, he's, he's come to Christ now. But I remember in that car, I just remember that feeling of just, it was it, man. There was nothing. I remember so bad. It was just the worst... Point of, and from that point, I lost hope. That's where hopelessness, hopelessness came in. That's where my heart broke. That's where I gave up. That's why waking up in a hospital bed did not matter. That's why the day I could, I had to learn how to walk again from that bed. The day I could walk, I walked out of that hospital. That, that's why. It's because my, that moment. And I have to tell you that God has put a dream in your heart 
that God has put things in your heart. And it says here, never doubt God's mighty power to work in you and accomplish all this. He will achieve infinitely more than your greatest request, your most unbelievable dream and exceed your wildest imagination. He will outdo them all for his miraculous power constantly energizes you. What this does is it moves us from a cannot to a can. It moves us from stuck to free. It moves us from impossible to possible. That's what this passage is saying. It's saying, you're not stuck. You're not stuck, you just don't know how. That's all. You're not stuck, you just don't know how. Or you're not stuck, you're just not doing what you do know how. You're not stuck. The scripture says that he who the sun sets free is free indeed. That means you're not stuck. Anyway, I want to I want to walk through uh, just a little bit of something that I, I think will help people who feel stuck get unstuck. First Kings, chapter three, verse four. Have a tissue, please. Thanks. Now I understand why preachers have those hankies. I'm going to get me one. Get all T.D. Jakes on y'all. All right. First Kings chapter 3, verse 4. The king went down to Gideon, uh, to Gibeon, rather. Now this king is King Solomon. He was the f first heir, as in the, the next generation from King David, who was basically the greatest king that ever ruled Israel. The king that God used as a reference for every other king uh, through the history of Israel and Judah. Um, and this was, his, this was the, fir the first son after him. So he had big shoes to fill. He had this man, we're just putting it into context. This guy had big shoes to fill. The king, the new king, let's use that word, help us understand it. The new king went to Gibeon, which sounds like a zoo animal, to offer sacrifices. For that was the most important high place. And Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings at that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream. And God said, ask for whatever you want me to give you. Solomon answered, you have shown great kindness to your servant, my father David, because he was faithful to you and upright uh, and righteous and upright in heart. You have continued this great kindness to him and have given him a son to sit on his throne to this very day. Now, Lord, my God. You have made your servant king in place of my father, David, but I am only a little child. Just for some context, he was a grown man, but he's just so we understand that. But I am only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. So God said to him, since you have asked for this, not long life or wealth in, uh, for yourself, nor have you asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment in administering justice, I will do what you asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart so there will never be anyone like you, nor... Uh, Moreover, I will give you what you have not asked, both, both wealth and honor, or so nor will they ever be. Moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for, both wealth and honor, so that in your lifetime there will be no equal among kings. You will have no equal among kings. And if you walk in obedience to me, keep my decrees and commands as David your father did, I will give you a long life. Then Solomon awoke and he realized it had been a dream. Talk about a genie in a bottle moment. Talk about a genie in a bottle moment. I love those genie movies, man. You rub them and the genie pops out and they're like, I give you three wishes. And if you're like, you know, the Aladdin, remember Aladdin? And there's all the song and dance about it. And then we've got the new one, the remake with Will Smith. And it's like, you got three wishes, three rules. Can't wish for more wishes. Can't make someone fall in love with you. Can't kill anyone. But this says God could kill them if he wanted to. Turns out that one's a false one. I can't every, believe everything you ever see on Disney. 
But talk, but it's real. Like God's encountered this man, and 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 all and all. Listen, listen, listen. All God actually said to him, He just spoke to him regarding what was we read with the passage we read, Ephesians chapter three and verse twenty. He said, "Just, just whatever you want's there, and it's possible." Which is what we read in Ephesians verse uh, chapter three and verse twenty. You read that passage. That is a genie in a bottle moment. Revelation of that passage is a genie in a bottle moment. That's God saying, the world is open before you. Heaven is open before you. There is no limits. And he said this to Solomon. And, I, and Solomon's response, now, he says, so give your servant, and he says, basically, hey, you, you've called me to do some stuff and I'm not up for it. You call me some dude, he says, in, my, in the natural, I'm not up for it. He yeah. says, so give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. Now, I, I've, pro, I've, I've, this has been one of the passages that I've meditated on for almost as long as I've been uh, walking with Christ. Because, I mean, who, who wouldn't? Like, there's a genie moment here. Like, okay, Solomon got his genie, give me my genie. It's in the book, man. It's for you. True story. And and I've just and I've searched that and meditated on that for for many many years and for just many hours. And one of the things I've sort of was thinking is like, okay, well, when you read through Proverbs, he's essentially he's asked for wisdom and understanding. Is essentially what he's asked for. And Proverbs talks about the value of wisdom and 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 wisdom, and it talks so much stuff. It says about like. Seek me instead of gold and riches, instead of honor, instead of long life, all of these things. It just says, seek me, seek understanding. And then as we read through Proverbs, we actually unpack that, that with wisdom is long life. With wisdom is, is uh, financial gain. With wisdom is honor. With wisdom is, is uh, social elevation. All of these things, health, all of these things come with wisdom and understanding. And so I'm like reading this and thinking, oh, okay, so he's tapped into a key that was already there by asking for wisdom and to a degree that is the case but it's not entirely the case because I want to show you the actual key I want to show you the key here because remember God said ask for anything and I'll give it to you and he's asked for something and God says because you've asked for that I'll give you everything it says here so give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people that too is critical Two is critical and to distinguish between right and wrong he's asked for something for a purpose he's asked for something for the purpose of pursuing his call what he said is God God says you can have anything and what he says is God I want to be able to feel, fulfill the call of my life I want to be able to, to fulfill the call of my life. This thing you put in me, I, I need to go after that. And God says, bang, right answer. Right answer. So we're at this point where most of us, pretty much everybody, and especially in our, our society, you know, we're in a first world country. Our basic needs are generally met. You know, there's a principle called Maslow's hierarchy of need where food and shelter and protection, these basic things. And then as you go up the chain, we, we come to this place of when we're in this world of comfort, which we are in the, in the first world, we have this thing where we, we they, they've got all highfalutin words about actualization and, um, you know, different things. But, but essentially, it's this point where you, you know you're meant for more. You know you're meant for more. You know it. You're not satisfied with living on the couch, chewing Smith's chips, drinking your chosen beverage, waiting for the next day. It just doesn't work for you. And, and Solomon, he was king. He, he could have sat back and rested. He could have. But, but he wasn't content to do that. And I think most of us aren't content to do that. You know why? Because God won't let you be. You get everything you want and you're miserable. You're like, what? I've got this great job. I've got these great kids. I've got this great home. I've got everything and I'm miserable. 
And then and one of the reasons why I think we've got this massive division going on in our culture is because you've got so many people who have everything they want and they still need a cause. They still need a cause. So they look for whatever will offend them to give them a cause. That's what it's about. People looking for a cause because they're not answering the call of the cause that God's put in their heart. So what I really want us to get is what Solomon got. God says, you can have anything. And he says, God, I want to answer the call of my life. I want to answer the call of my life. Now, easier said than done. But we have to get it from somewhere. I want to show us how we get there. Got a little bit of time left. Mark chapter 10 and verse 13 it says, the people were bringing little children to Jesus for him to show, to, to place his hands on them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive, uh, sorry, who will not receive the kingdom like a little child will never enter it. He took his arms, placed his hands on them and blessed them. Very next verse, like in your Bibles, they got like these headings sometimes, and sometimes they can confuse things because it separates things that the, script, the author never meant to be separated. You know, in the Bible, in the original text, there isn't numbers, there isn't chapters, there isn't verses, and there most certainly isn't subheadings. They're convenient and they're handy, but sometimes it, it can interrupt what the author's trying to say, what the Holy Spirit's trying to tell you through the passage. It just jumps straight down to this another story, well, the continuing story where there's a rich young ruler. He comes to Jesus and he's like, Jesus, well, like you're the best. You're the man. I, I'm also the man. <laughs> I want to go to heaven. And Jesus is like, cool. Sell everything you've got. Give it to the poor. Come and follow me. And then the scripture says that he, he, he walked away because he's very rich. He walked away sad because he's very rich. And I just, I, it just breaks my heart, that guy, you know? It just breaks my heart. And, and the passage goes on further. And, and all, um, Peter, it says, at, at, at this, verse 22, it says, at this the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Wouldn't you think great wealth would make you happy? Turns out it doesn't. He was sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Peter spoke up. Peter always spoke up. I've got a kid like Peter. <laughs> we have left everything to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and for the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age, homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children and fields, along with persecutions. You don't go praying for that bit, do you? And in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last and last first. It's this amazing contrast where Jesus is saying to this guy, he started by talking to the kids. He started by saying, if you can't come to me and interact with me like these guys, interact with me like these little ones, you can't do it. It doesn't work. Then this guy who was you know, big and elevated in the world standard comes to him. He's a good guy. This guy was a genuinely good person. It says, hey, I want to follow you. And Jesus is like, okay, cool. Yeah, you just need to have nothing. And it doesn't mean you have to do this. This was Jesus' instruction to him. And he says he couldn't do it because he, was, he, had, he, he, he had too much to lose. And then Jesus' disciples were like, whoa. But then they looked at themselves and thought, you know what? We've lost everything to follow you. We've lost everything to follow you. We've taken an unpopular route. We've walked away from our family businesses. We've probably offended our parents by leaving the family family business. We've embarrassed our parents by following some renegade preacher who's going against culture. We're 
we, we, and they're like at this point, it's like, whoa, we're actually doing what you've asked that guy to do. And, and Jesus says, yeah, but don't get a, like, he's like, yeah, but you're going to end up a hundred times better off in this life and the life to come. We, we honored Pastor Malcolm short, a little while ago, and, and he's, he left the East Coast to the West Coast and his family, and, and he didn't abandon his children. They were grown and stuff, but, you know, time he would like to have spent with them. But he's had thousands of kids in the, in the faith come through, and, and God hasn't left him without. We, can, we encounter God with this position of bravado, and God says, you just can't do it like that. You just can't do it like that. He says, the way to come to me is you lose all that. You get rid of all that. And then come to me. And then we unlock everything. Everything is unlocked at that point. We can't come to God with our lists of requirements. We can't do that. It's not how it works. Some of us come to God and say, God, I'll serve you on my terms. I'll serve you on my terms. And, and then obviously as we come into a church context, we really start to serve God. Because the most important thing to God, you've got to understand, is you and your neighbor and your brother and your sister and your mom and your dad and your family and the other people. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Another place says he doesn't want any to perish, but that all would come to saving knowledge of him. Jesus' last will and testament was going to all of the world and preach the gospel. To really understand the call on your life. It is tied into the Great Commission. Your call is not independent of the Great Commission. Your call is not independent of what God wants to do to rescue mankind and help mankind flourish. Now, we saw that King Solomon, his reasoning was to serve your people, to know right and wrong. That is absolutely reflected in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33, where Jesus says, don't go chasing the stuff. Instead, give all of your time and energy to my kingdom, my righteousness, and all of the stuff will be given to you. There's a key. There's a key. It's by putting God first. It's by putting his kingdom first. It's by putting what's first to him, first to you. I love the local church because we are an expression of what is first on God's mind. We are an expression of... We need to get out of our head that church uh, uh, is, is about you. It's about you and it's not about you. What do they talk? What, there's a cliche saying which says the church is the only organization that exists for other people. It doesn't exist for itself. It exists for other people. We've got to get out of our head that this Sunday is only about you. Yeah, it's about you. It's like the same as a petrol station is about the car. But the car goes to the petrol station to get filled up, to go about its purpose, to do what the owner needs it to do. Church is a place where we come to get filled up. Church is a place that people can come to meet with Jesus. Do you know, every single role of service in the church has one core. It comes back to one, one key function is to help people meet Jesus. It's to help people encounter God. We're in worship this morning. Amazing, amazing. We were so blessed with our worship team. Their job was to help you engage with Jesus. We have friendly ushers at the front door. You know, if you're a sour, angry sort of person, that's cool, that's your deal. But we're not... We're not going to ask you to be on the front door. That's because that job is so important. That job is to open a door and help people come in to encounter Jesus. We've got kids workers, kids ministers. Their job 
is to help these little ones encounter Jesus. Their job is to prepare these little ones to go out into a world where they might be the only Christian kid in their class. Where they have to be able to navigate the temptations and the challenges in, in such a confusing world. My job as a preacher is to minister healing, is to bring the word of God in a way that's actionable. So I, I figure if, I, if you leave and you can't do something I said, I wasted my time. The people up the back, you know, we serve good coffee. Oh, I think that Jesus would serve good coffee. We know that the wine he served was the best. He doesn't do rubbish. We serve good coffee. That's so when people come here. I'm very serious. That's so when people come here. There is nothing to interrupt them connecting with Jesus. It helps them know that they cared about. It helps that extra work that goes into that is actually an expression of the love of Christ. The extra cost that goes into the nicer coffee is an expression of the love of Jesus Christ. We make things look as nice as we're able. That's so when people come in, nothing's interrupting them. Nothing's distracting them. As little as possible, because we don't want anything to interfere with people connecting with Jesus. We do things well, as well as we're able, not because we're perfectionists. Some of us is a little bit OCD, but it's not about impressing people. It's, it's not about impressing people. It's about expressing the love of Jesus. So we have an opportunity in church to come, use the gifts that God's put in our lives to express the love of Christ. And when we do that, when Solomon prayed, he said, God, just help me to serve you. Help me to... God said, yes, that's the answer I'm looking for. When we serve in church, we're, we're, we're tapping into the heartbeat of God. And, and for most of us, church service isn't our key service. For most of us, it's not. It's just a tiny bit of our week. But can I just... It's a really important part of our week. It's really critical. This is the point where people can come in. In Western Australia, the most people come to Christ is through coming into a church door. And I'm about to lead us in a prayer. And, and it's through actually responding to that prayer is, is how most people in Western Australia actually first take that commitment of faith. And I love the local church. I love it. I love the people in the local church. I love my city. And God has amazing things for your life, but I can promise you it does not get unlocked by going after them. The amazing things in God, that God has for you get unlocked by going after him. It's a paradox. I don't understand it, but you want fruit, you put bury a seed. Life, the kingdom is paradoxical. I'm going to pray. My time's up. Thank you, Jesus. I want to pray two prayers. The first is I want to, I just want to activate people. Actually, I'm going to open up the altar afterwards. I'm going to pray for people. I just feel like God just wants to activate people. But before I pray and do that, I just want to speak to you. And if you have never made Jesus the Lord of your life, or maybe you have, and, but you're far from him now and you just want to come home, I'm just going to pray and I'm just going to ask that if that's you, just with every head bowed and every eye closed, you just would slip your hand in the air. No one's looking around. Even if you're in the lounge room watching this or listening in your car, just as a step of faith, just, just pop your hand in the air. And I just want you to repeat after me. Church, even if you're in faith, I just when we're joining in with these people. Dear God, today I come home. Please forgive me for living life my own way. I want more than anything for your will in my life. 
from today forwards, I will follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm just going to pray for us all right now. Lord, I just bless this congregation. I bless just everybody that's just within the sound of my voice. Lord, you know exactly where each and every person are at. You know the frustrations, the hopelessness, the disappointment, the heartbreak. I just feel like some people here just, God just said, there's someone here that's starting again from scratch. You literally have nothing. God just said, that's a good place to be. Lord, you know us all. You know the dreams you put in our hearts. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. That we would be activated. We put you first. We need you, God. We believe that you have an amazing plan for our life. We commit, Lord, to fulfilling it in our lifetime. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're just going to worship a little bit, church, and I just want that to marinate. And just if God spoke to you, man, just 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 deal with it. Just interact with God on it. If anyone wants prayer for anything for healing in their body, or if that word spoke to you particularly, and you just want just just to come out and and, and God will just just do something with that word. We'd love to pray with you.